Okay, welcome to Fascinating Reporting with Postgres, PSQL, and SendMail. I am Christopher L. Augustus. People who know me just call me Chris. And if you want to download this presentation, there should be a link somewhere on the Postgres Open 2019's website. But if not, you can go to the blue link right there at my place of business and download it from there. So, a little bit about me. Uh, I live most of my life in East Tennessee in one of the green counties in the Oak Ridge, Knoxville, and North City area, except for three and a half years when I was over at Tennessee Technological University, which is over a little bit in the middle of Tennessee in the Yellow County. I currently am employed by a little company called IA. We've actually just recently doubled our size, and they contract me to the Department of Energy's Office of Science and Technical Information and that's located in Oak Ridge, and what we do, we collect the technical papers and even citations of journal articles from all the research the Department of Energy funds, and we bring it in, we process it, and then we put it out on a website so that you as the taxpayers can get to this research that you paid for <laughs> at some level. Our data goes back to the 1940s, and we even have journal articles cited back way beyond that. On a personal level, if you just want to hear me yap about stuff, I have a 29-minute podcast I put out usually once a month, and that link's on there. If you download this presentation, all the links should be live. So here's the plan for the class, and it's busted up into four pieces. First, we're going to look at the PSQL tool that you get with Postgres. Then we're going to look at SQL. Then we're sort of going to change gears for just a little bit, and we're going to look at Unix Linux send mail. So if you create these reports, it's nice to have a way of being able to send them out by email. This is one way of doing it. Then the icing on the cake is an automated reporting system, which is what you'll see is almost exactly what we're running at Ostio today. Before I get too deep into kind of like my philosophy on programming, there's the Paul McCartney philosophy, and there's John Lennon, of course, to the Beatles. Paul McCartney likes to start simple and complicate it later if you have to. So his song Yesterday is a good example. He woke up one morning and he was thinking scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs. And he wandered around the house, sat down on the piano, and he started doing the first few notes, scrambled eggs, scrambled eggs. Pretty soon he had the first verse written, yesterday, all my trouble seemed so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Got in the studio recorded the song twice. The second take, George Martin looked at it, their producer, and he said, hey, you know, if we had some strings to it, this would be perfect. So he and Paul kind of worked out what that would be, recorded the strings, and that's the song you can hear today. John Lennon, on the other hand, he liked to start complicated, and then you had to like mesh it down to something that was usable, almost simple at that point. Strawberry Fields Forever is a good example of one of his songs. He recorded take after take. He had the Beatles do different things over and over and over. And then he sat down with their producer, George Martin, and said, now let's put this together. And they had to speed the song up, slow the song down, overdub, to the point where some of the analog duplications they did got to a point, at the end of the song, John Lennon says something, and if you listen to the original recording, it sounds like, I buried Paul. You listen to the earlier takes, you can hear him clearly say cranberry sauce. So I'm a Paul McCartney developer. I like to start simple, and if I've got to complicate it later, sure. So for all the examples in this presentation, I created a simple Doctor Who database. And it's a schema, and there's a link you can download that from if you want to run these yourself. And basically, it's a database of all the Doctor Who stories from the classic series, which would be 159, and then as a detail to that, I've got a 695 record episode table. So everything I'm going to query is going to be from that. So now let's look at the P tool PSQL. According to the Postgres webpage, it is a, an interactive terminal. And it's a terminal-based front end of Postgres, and there's a few more things it does, but in red's the important part that I keyed off of when we scooted to Postgres nine years ago. It provides a number of meta commands and various shell-like features to facilitate writing scripts and automating a wide variety of tasks. 
That's important for what's going to come up later. So how do you connect to it? And there's a bunch of ways. And for the reporting that I do, there, this is the preferred way we do it. You set up a .pg pass file, and Postgres has great documentation on it. The one thing to be careful about is make sure you set the permissions to 600 so that only your Unix Linux user can see that. Um, and it actually says in the documentation, although I've not ever tried it out, if you make the permissions be anything different, it will ignore the file. And then of course, if you make them different than that, someone else could easily get in there and see it. Then in my shell, I set four environment variables, which points to the database, the host, the port, and then the user. And these are, of course, fake users. This wouldn't actually work anywhere. So if you just go into PSQL and you do a very simple select star from stories for just season one and order by the story ID, and you get decent looking output. And that's where a lot of developers just stop. Okay, yeah, here it is, here's your data. What I'm gonna show you is all the wonderful stuff you can do beyond that. And I put a green arrow on order by, and I've impressed this upon our junior developers a lot. Always order your results. If you get results back and maybe story two is first and then story one is last, it's like, what, what's going on with that? Unless you're trying to alphabetize it, but if you're trying to alphabetize it by name, then you should have ordered by the name. So I make that, I really try and plant that on our young developers. Always order your results. And then there are the PSQL meta commands. And they always start with backslash. And Postgres 11, if you group some together, have 56 major backslash commands. And that's worth looking through the documentation on. There, there's things you may never have to use. So just a quick overview of some of these. The backslash Q is a clean way to exit from PSQL. You can get help. The backslash D command is useful for seeing details of objects. You do this backslash D and a table name, and you'll see your table structure. Slash echo, nice way just to put some output out, and you'll see it later. The backslash copy is an awesome way to get data into and out of Postgres. That's worthy of a talk all unto itself, and I'll show some great examples of it later. Um, brand new in Postgres 11, and I've not had a chance to play with it, are the backslash if commands, where you can do if, thens, and else's. And then um, backslash set is useful for setting and viewing variables, which we won't get into in this class, but that is a great, great, great feature. And the backslash p set, which is useful for formatting, which is exactly what we're gonna get into. And if you just put in the p set command, it gets, it'll show you back in Postgres 11 all of these options. We're only going to touch on the red bolded ones. There's a whole lot more. The online documentation for this is actually great and explains them well. So going back to our default query, um, we have the PSET line style ASCII, which is the default. And if you do that with a border of zero, you get this table where you just have lines, and they're actually not lines, they're dashes underneath the column headings. If I change the border to one, now we get back to what looked like just the pure default when we went into PSQL. If I make it two, now we've got dashes, pipe symbols, and little pluses at the joins, so you get this very nice looking ASCII table. Now here's where things get interesting. If you, which probably everybody nowadays can support Unicode, if you use the PSET line style Unicode, you can get prettier letters or pure, prettier characters. Um, previously we were showing ASCII, there's something called old ASCII and if you're putting, if your data has embedded line feeds or carriage returns, there would be a difference between ASCII and old ASCII. And like I said, Unicode, and here are the three examples with Unicode with the different borders. Now you've got, with a border zero, nice solid looking lines across the top. If you go to border one, now you've got 
horizontal and vertical lines and the nice Unicode, I guess you call it the cross in there. And my son did point this out. This presentation was made with LibreOffice running on a Fedora 30 laptop. So some things aren't just completely perfect, but we're, this is all open source. So <laughs> well, those sort of fun things. But he pointed out there's a little bit of a disjoint in there, and that's, that is what it is. But I paid nothing for the OS, the presentation software. And then my favorite output is the border style two with Unicode set. And if someone asks me, Chris, I need you to get me the counts of something other real fast, I'll go into PSQL, dump my query in there, put that out, copy, paste it in my email, send it, they get it, and they go, oh, that looks nice. So that's my default go-to when I send people data. Then you can also set titles. You can turn on and off the footers, and you can turn on and off tuples only. And the title's kind of fun. If you set the title, it'll put a title at the top of your table of output. If you put it in double quotes, you can actually have multiple words. And once you set a title, it is set until you either call PSET title with nothing or you change it to another value. And that can zap you sometimes. If you run a query in a window you have, and then an hour later, it's like, okay, I'm gonna run another query, and you just plop a query in there, it comes up, it's like, where'd that title come from? Oh yeah, an hour ago I'd set that. That's just how it works. There's a backslash C is a shortcut for that. You can also turn on and off the little X rows footer at the bottom. And then for tuples only, you can make it show just the rows without the header or with the header and the rows. So for a title, it's pretty easy. You can see I say Doctor Who season one and then after I run the query, now I have this nice title at the top. If I say um, footer off, that little rows goes away. On the previous slide, you can see there were eight rows. Now it's gone. And then tuples only for reporting probably isn't very useful, usually most of the time, but here there's no headers on the top, just your columns of data. That'd be better in some sort of data export if for some reason copy didn't do what you needed it to do. And then you can actually change the format Everything we've looked at so far has been aligned, but there's actually eight others. So there's one added in Postgres 9.5. I think I failed to mention this. All these examples run in Postgres 9.4 to 11, which are our currently supported versions, unless I make a little mention. And here's one that wouldn't run in 9.4. It's ASCII doc. I'm not exactly sure what that's useful for, but it is possible to do. Here's a good example of unaligned, and out of the box, you'll put a pipe between your fields and a return between your um, records. And, that, and both of those are, um, as it shows at the bottom, you can set those. HTML is great for emailed reports and it produces HTML code. One thing to be aware of, there's not an HTML start of a document or an end or even the body starter end, and you'd have to put that in yourself, and there's a reason for that, and you'll see that towards the end of the presentation. And then if you ran that, this is output you might see depending on what your browser is. And then if you're into um, this format, um, you can say format LaTeX or LaTeX, depending on how you're supposed to say that. And apparently, people stay up all night long arguing this. It's <laughs> um, it, you look online, it's like there's heated arguments. It's <laughs> so um, kind, kind of example of that. Um, one time, there were several people arguing how you pronounce the capital of Kentucky. And, I, I was, and they came to me, well, how, how you pronounce the capital of Kentucky? You, I say you pronounce it Louisville. And they said, no, 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 it's Louisville. And the other no, it's Louisville. And they said, Chris, can you answer it? It's like, I can answer it real fast. I pronounce it Frankfurt. You can use that one. <laughs> Someone can use that tomorrow morning. At the <laughs> we have one of those. 
Then there's also the trough MS format, which dates back to the 1960s. And so I had to go look that up. I was like, some of these I just don't know anything about. And I was like, oh, okay. So Postgres supports a document format all the way back to the 60s. And then there's the expanded, and it's kind of hard to explain it. They're trying to hear. The best way to understand expanded is just to look at it. If you run it with expanded off, which is the default, you see tables like you normally do, the IDs and the names. If you expand that, then you see record one, and here's the story ID, and it's value across from that. And then you see the name, and it's value across from that. This is great where if you have 100, and I think it's 37 wide row tables, like we have one at my place of business, that's about the only way you're gonna see a record. You can't get a terminal wide enough to try to display 137 columns. This way I can actually display it. And then this, the slash, backslash copy command is proof Postgres developers love us. The, this is one of the most powerful commands. There's also an SQL command that's copy, but you have to be a super user to use it. Backslash copy, any user that can log into the database and query records from a table could use it. And here's two little examples where I select just the season one stories from uh, the stories table, and I send it to standard out, common delimited CSV header. And that's what it looks like. The second example, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm sending it to a file dw.csv, and I'll put that in whatever your current, wherever PSQL is running from on your Linux box, it'll put there. Not sure what exactly happens on Windows. Of course, you want to be safe, always give it a full path to where it goes, and then you don't have to worry about, well, where did it go? It, then you always know. Um, you can output and copy in three different forms, uh, CSV for common delimited, and there's a text format, and there's a binary format. And there's, outside of reporting, there might be reasons you'd use text or binary. So that's an introduction to formatting in PSQL. Now we're gonna jump on to Postgres SQL. This class is marked as a beginner class, and there's some things in here that are gonna be novice, some things are gonna be beginner, and then there's some things that go complex. And if you lose your place in any of this, that's okay. It, because the next section, it's almost like we're gonna change big gears, and, it, and it's okay if you lose out something. Um, here are just two links to Postgres's documentation. So if you wanna do something as simple as changing the column headings to something a human can understand, then right after each field, in double quotes, you can put like for instead of having STID, I'm saying pound sign. So, okay, that's like the story number. And then instead of ST name, I've got story name. And from a reporting point of view, that's what non-database users would like to see. Here's a little bit more complex idea. You can embed subqueries and select clauses. And we can get pretty nasty with some of the stuff we do, here's something pretty simple. Same query as before for season one, I just wanna count the number of episodes each story has. So in there in the red text where it says select count.star, that's just an aggregate function, and I wanna count every record for unearthly child, and there's four of them, and I count every single one of them, it counts up four. And then I alias the tables, the episodes table with uh, lowercase e, the stories table with lowercase s, and that's where in that where clause, I can join the episodes to the stories. And then there go, and then you can take my word for it unless you just know this, um, those are the correct counts. We can do something very similar with groups. We're going to join the stories to episodes and this is um, an SQL standard way of doing it, on, and then you, there's your story IDs coming from story and episodes. I've moved the count out now, I moved the count down to the third parameter, and then I have to group the stories. Any, ep, any field I show from the stories table, I've got to name in my group by clause. Then there's the always important order by clause at the end. 
I get the exact same answers. More proof Postgres developers love us, and this is not in the SQL standard, is when you're joining, there's the using. If you happen to be joining on the exact same field name between tables, and this could be one or many fields, if you, by using the using clause, it'll do that for you. And so again, you see the exact same results. But it is important to know your data. And th this is where you can get fouled up sometimes. What if I had a story with no episodes? Is anyone a big Doctor Who fan in here? Okay, Let's see one. Um, there was a story in 1979 that they started making big strike at the BBC and they yanked the plug on it and the videotape and film from it were thrown in the archive and they forgot about it. Um, so I've got a story that there's production record, there's a production record for it, Shada, but as you can see in the episode count, there's zero. So when I do this with a subquery, I see four episodes for all the earlier stories this season when they ran out of time for Shada, zero. If I join, I get Shada disappears. It's not there anymore. If I use an outer join, which basically says this is a left outer join, I'm saying in the stories database table, show me a record for every story and regardless of where you got records for the episodes, it doesn't matter. I want to see every record for the stories. But now there's a big problem. It acts like Shada has one episode, and that's because of, in the third line, the count star, I'm counting every record return. So I'm actually miscounting Shada's story as an episode there. So there's a way to fix that. A very simple fix. Instead of doing a count star, I count the EP number field. And if that field is null, I don't count it. If there's a value in that field, I count it. So now, Shadov is back to having zero episodes like it's supposed to. Know your data. <laughs> that's the best advice I can give on that. And then a um, little slide on sorting. Uh, if you sort by episode, name, you get kind of a weird thing, four sorts before one alphabetically, and that doesn't look good. So if you sort by the EP number field, then one comes for two, two becomes four, three, and this looks like good data. Arrays. In all fairness, nine years ago, I wondered who on earth needs arrays in a relational database. I don't, I don't know why. This was before discovering the rich set of functions in Postgres to handle arrays. And while at my place of work, we have very few arrays and tables, and one of the places I really scratched my head, what are you doing there, but it, it's rare. Um, but in reporting, using arrays at OSTI has become quite common. And there's another reference to where you can look this up. This is where we've kind of move, moved into more of the intermediate areas of Postgres. The array ag function aggregates an array. So when before I could show from, again, season 17, parts one, two, three, four on separate lines, if I aggregate that together, I put it into an array all on one line. And that's Postgres's default way of outputting arrays. I don't know if that can be changed, but that's not really too human friendly. And the, not wanting to pick on Shada too much, it's got a null array down at the bottom. So to pretty it up, the developers added array to string. So you pass it an array for a first parameter and the second parameter I picked as a semicolon and a space. When it outputs it, now you can see clearly parts one semicolon part two, semicolon, part three, semicolon, part four. And the null array for Shada just shows up as nothing because there were never any completed episodes for that one. 
So now we're going to move on to temporary tables. And temporary tables don't have to be complex. The, they usually are used for complex things, but the idea behind them is not. So if I wanted to go to my story table and select the ID, the story name, then jump over to the episodes table and grab an array of all the episode names, and I would like to put this in a temporary table. Well, the syntax is actually pretty easy. Create temporary table, and I made the story episodes table name blue so you can see it appear in the next examples. I create that as, and I just rerun that same query. So now I can just do select star from stories episodes, and if I had a huge screen here, you could see all the stories there showing that meta command, the backslash D, story episodes, I can actually see how that table is arranged, and the green arrow is pointing to the episode names is a character varying array at this point. Now why it says PG underscore temp underscore three is a schema, that I don't know. That's one of the mysteries of Postgres. Important thing about temporary tables, they last only as long as your session. When you end your session, like the backslash Q, it's gone. That's actually sort of nice that you won't have your database littered with temporary tables like that. So if you're running through these examples through the scripts at home, notice I got this little thing that says stay in the session, because on the next slide, I'm going to use the Postgres function unnest to basically unnest the array all the trouble I went through the array aggregation to take the column values and put up into a big long array, you can undo it with unnest. And there you can see the story of Unearthly Child, and there's its four names. The second story of the Daleks, there's its seven. Edge of Destruction only had two, and there it is. Now, what happens if you try this with Shada? Well, there's a null array, and it just has a blank there. And at this point in the session, because we're going to create a new temporary table just to prove one point, this time I made the episode names semicolon delimited, which mimics our legacy data we have at OSTI, where we'll have authors. We'll have author semicolon, author semicolon, author semicolon, author semicolon, author. And we would like to do something with them well, here's a very simple way you could do that. So first, I create the table. I create it, and then I do a select to make sure it looks right, and the data looks right. I have a semicolon delimited list of my episode names. I use the function, surprise, surprise, string to array, and I convert that semicolon delimited string back into an array. And you can see in the two columns, when I have episodes, as I've put them into the table, and then I've converted them to an array. And then we have distinct and distinct on. Um, distinct is part of the SQL standard, so it's very portable to other places, and it's great for showing unique or distinct values back in a query's result set. Distinct on with some fields in parentheses is not part of the SQL standard, and it can be a, used as a shortcut of very basic windowing functions. And in the description of this talk, it said we're not gonna go into quagmire of windowing functions. That has been and is a great topic for a whole session later. So for distinct, I wanna see the distinct episode names for season 17. I run the query and I see, okay, well there's part four, part one, part three, and part two. But then there's a um, blank there and five rows. Well, the blank is our friend Shada. You can configure in PSQL the null, or if you don't want to have to worry about that, because maybe this query won't be ran in PSQL, there's coalesce, and that's the most difficult function to spell correctly. It's, thank goodness that pgadmin3 and pgadmin4 will, if you have that turned on, the keyword will turn blue when you get it right. It's like, it's the worst thing to type in. But once you get it typed in correctly, 
now it's turned my empty Charlotte episodes into a nun. Um, one nice thing about coalesce, you can keep adding functions or keep adding parameters to the function. So you might have three fields that you want to try to show something, and if all three of those fields come up null, you can always have a string literal at the end. And if everything evaluates to null and coalesce, then it will just pass on through a coalesce. And then we've got distinct on. And this is useful if you want to do something where you have a detailed table and you want to show the first string from it, or you want to show or the first field from it or the last field. So in this case, I wanted to see what is the episode number of the first story, or the first episode of a story, and what was its name. So this is, um, what you do is, in the distinct on, in parentheses, you can put the one or more fields that you want to be the, can't think of the exact thing to call it, but it's, it's the base of what you're, in this case, it's the story name. Actually, in this case, it's the story ID. And that's why it has to be unique. It's like, I was telling some of the guys at lunch, I'm gonna get to a slide, I'm gonna go like, I don't remember the slide. Well, this time I'm going through the presentation. This is a slide I don't remember. So we got that out of the way. <laughs> um, so then you show the story, the episode number, and then the first episode name. So for Unearthly Child, the first episode ought to be episode one, and it is, and the first episode name just happens to also be the story name, and it goes through all that. And what's important and why it's in red, you have to order by whatever you put in the parentheses at the top, st underscore id, and then that next field you order beyond that says which will be the first ones. Since that's a normal ascending order, it's gonna be whatever record comes up first, and that'll always be the first episode. Jumping over, what is the last episode name of each story? Now this is a little bit harder to do. All I did was on the order by, I switched that over to the episode number sorting order to this descending. And now for an earthly child, you look at it, you see episode number four, the fire maker. You know, all the way down the list, that's the way it goes. Funny story, just something to watch out for when you're developing. One of our developers went to Stack Overflow and needed to do something like this and found out, oh, I can use distinct on and used it. And he checked and the version we had of Postgres in development supported that, he did. Okay, everything went along fine. It went through testing, which was that same version. Production was supposed to have been upgraded and it got delayed. And his report got deployed to production and first time they went to use it, boom, it blew up. And they come hollering to me, hey, why is it not working? Well, I said, well, give me the query. Let's see what's going on. Gives me the query, I look, and I go to my version, because I didn't know the syntax. I went, went to the, my version of the documentation, I'm like, it doesn't exist. And then I thought, uh-oh. I went to the current version of the documentation. There it was, distinct on. I'm looking at it going, well, this is an awesome function. Shame we don't have it in production yet. Shame we won't have it for a month. So I went through, redid it with windowing functions, gave him back his query and said, okay, put this in there and then put a ticket in when we get upgraded in production. Then you can revert back to your other code because that actually is great. Good stuff. Distinct on is one of the reasons why Postgres developers love the users. Okay, now we can change gears. I'm gonna get a sip of water. We're gonna look at Unix or Linux send mail. And send mail is an electronic mail transport agent. It sends messages to one or more recipients, routing the message over water networks are necessary. Send mail does internet working forwarding as necessary to deliver the messages to the correct place. And when I looked up how old this was, it dates back to 1983. For all my examples, the SendMail has a ton of parameters. 
I'm going the Paul McCartney route again. I'm going the simple route. I'm going to use send mail hyphen T, which basically means read the message you make for recipients. One little word of note, I tried to configure send mail on two different Linux boxes at home. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I went through examples, other people's stuff. I never made it work. At my place of business, it works beautiful. So that's a more of a system administration thing. I'm more of a developer DBA, so that doesn't make sense. All these examples of mail, I actually had to take them to work to make them work. So if you can't make send mail work, it's okay. <laughs> um, a good old hello world example, and this is Unix stuff. Ooh, okay. Um, I'll just make a temporary text file and to make it easy for you to cut paste, um, I cat it to temp.txt, I send it to a fake user, subject test one, and then the actual message of the body is, hello world, this is test one. Control D, and then you cat your temp file to send mail with that hyphen T option, and then there in the pale blue box, that's what you'd get. A little bit more complex, if you want to send it to the email to two users, you want to CC two additional users, and you want to um, blind carbon copy two additional users, and you want to make it look like it came from another user, you can do that. And when you see that example in the blue box, you can see the twos, the CCs, and no BCC. If you want to send UTF-8 text-based emails, now this is where you complicate it just a little bit more. Um, you have to set the MIME type to version 1.0, set the content type to text slash plain, semicolon, and here's the important part to get your UTF-8 going into it. Character set equals UTF-8, UTF and then the content disposition inline, which means it's gonna be what you see in the message of the email. I just wanted to use a note, and that's a UTF note or Unicode UTF-8 note. I've emphasized the size because if I left it small, you would it just look like a blob on the screen. And when you send that email, there's your note. For HTML, it's not that much more complicated. You, my, my type stays the same. The content type, you make a text slash HTML. And if you're using Postgres, by default, it's a UTF-8 database, so use UTF-8. The, um, it's an inline message, and then you make a very simple test HTML document, and when it's sent, you get an HTML email out. And if you're already putting two and two together, you can see what's gonna happen in the next section. Here's the most complex example I've got. This is putting a binary file into an email, and we're 12, 11-ish minutes of time left, so I'm not gonna get too deep into this. The blue arrow points to multi-part mixed, and then you set a boundary, and everywhere that boundary shows up, I put a yellow arrow. The first time I looked up how to do this, and it took a while to figure out how to do this, it, there's not, it seemed like there wasn't an awesome example in one place on the internet how to do that. But the first example I looked up, they use that character set, uh, the, the Q1, WE, and I just stuck with it. It works. So after the first boundary, then this looks familiar. You say, okay, I want to put a text HTML character set, this position in line still, and then I do a little simple HTML document, end of HTML document. There's the important boundary again. And then I say, I want a text plain UTF-8, a base 64 encoding, and content disposition is no longer in line, it's an attachment. And then I just, I can name it anything I want. It's smart to keep it the name of the document you want it to be. 
this case, I'm going to try to send a PDF. For the moment, save that because we're going to go to part two. And then I have to cat the document, and this is an actual PDF, to UU encode, which turns 8-bit characters into 7-bit characters that can be sent by email. And that's a, technically a base 64 um, type of way of doing that. I put the document name in there again, and I concatenate that to my temp file. And then I have to put a boundary concatenated to the temp file at the end. But the proof's in the pudding. I send it, and there's my PDF. I can double click on it, it opens it. If you don't UU encode that PDF, you get digital goo. Now we're to the final section. Mm. A little less than 10 minutes left. This is the automated reporting system. It's the icing on the cake. We're there. A complex automated reporting system is what a coworker of mine wanted to do. And he had all these complex, I mean, basically it was a John Lennon application he wanted to do. I know why he wanted to do it. He had to keep writing these complex reports into our one application. And he said, there's got to be an easier way. And I was like, I don't know. Um, the last point, ultimately, it never progressed beyond wishes and talk. But this idea didn't die in my mind. I kept thinking, how would Paul McCartney approach this? I want a simple automated reporting system. So I, have, I had a pain that users would have me write these reports, and then they come back and they say, oh, I need you to change recipients. Okay, I'd change them, I'd have to pull out the source control, change it, put it back in, test it, all this stuff. It got, it got crazy, and I thought, if I could just have a list of these somewhere, it would be so much easier. I didn't have a lot of time to do this, so I just took a little baby steps. So phase one, I came up with simple requirements. I need a database table to store recipients, and I need a function to get those recipients out of the database tables. And then I need to assign a unique report ID to each one of those, so I can easily, someone says, I need report number 23 fixed, I need these people put on it or these people taken off. It's like, oh, okay. Makes that a ton easier than some name that doesn't mean much to me. The test phase one, um, I just needed to find a report that was low profile or rarely used. And so fairly easy requirements. The names are changed to protect the innocence, but these are actually the two tables we are using at Austi. Um, one's reports. And we got a report ID, a report title, and a report description. And the ID, I don't even have a sequence to assign those. What I do is, when I create a new report, I go to production, I say, okay, the highest table number, or highest report number is this. I mentally add one to it, and I add the record in myself. And then for the emails, I really don't have to do anything but in development and test, I just reuse that same number. And then I go through and I say, okay, report ID in the fields, and that's where you can be a to field, a CC, a BCC, or the from. Then, of course, you got an email address, and now I threw in a little complication, an active flag. Someone's on vacation, don't want to be bombarded with emails, so they get back and there's hundreds and they're waiting on them. Well, you can always click them off. Then there's a database function. I created, and this is actually an SQL function. And one of the cool parts is up at the green arrow, it returns a set of text. So this is like, it's almost like calling a table when you call this thing. You get text out. And then I, when I select from trying to get like, I'm, the whole point of this function is to make send mail friendly I guess you almost call it header idea, where you have the twos, the cc's, the bcc's, and the from. I just format that in there so that I can put that in, and then I concatenate that to the email address, then boom, there it is, ready to go. The yellow arrow is always important. I order by the fields, so if I'm debugging, I can get in there very easily and go, okay, from here, and I can always know the predicted order. And um, the red arrow is just pointing out that this is an SQL function. It is not a PLPG SQL function. Populating the tables is easy. This is more here just to show you how to do it. 
if you use the, want to go through these examples at home. And um, then there's the shell script. So I start off and in the shell script, you can pass it one parameter and that's the Doctor Who season. And so I grab that from what's coming in and store that as a human readable variable. Then as you saw early on in the presentation, I set the export, the, the database name, host, port, and user, and the password sitting in the .pg pass file. And then I assign it the report ID of one. Next part of the script, I call PSQL with the um, hyphen hyphen quad option. That way you don't get all the banners, open source software banners and stuff at the front, you know, sending that thing out on your email. And it's a little uh, Unix Linux thing, the end of SQL, everything between that end of SQL and what will be at the, on the fourth slide is all gonna be sent to Postgres. Ooh. And then we've got um, awk nf gets rid of line feeds because you can get line feeds in your data at the top. So then we go through and just kind of going through this real fast, I do some PSET formatting, which was from the first section. And then I select from my um, function I wrote, report similar recipients, I pass it that report ID and there's all my recipients. Then I go to the subject line and I just select that out of my reports table. And why I really do it work, a lot of times I'll concatenate onto it, ran on this date at this time because our data changes and it's important to know that the data changed. Then I start an HTML email, nothing we haven't seen before. And we go through and eventually, middle of the screen, we run the query. And then a nice little thing I do at the end, the report ID, I always stick at the end report. So someone sends me a report and says, add me to this. I go at the end of this, like, okay, I'll add you. Then we send it to user sbin simmail t and the email goes out. And here's some tests of phase one. Again, I had to do this at work because I couldn't get simmail to work from home. And there's season 17 and Shada with its missing story or missing episodes. Okay, this is a complex example of sending email with a CSV attachment. And we're just about out of time, so I'm going to just jump through this. It works almost exactly like the send mail one did, but the whole point is you send it out, and up there at the top is your. Um, common delimited file, which someone can open up and read in Excel, LibreOffice, Calc, where we want to do. So for phase two, which we've actually accomplished, a Java web application, Java web application was written, which allows our end users to go in and add or take themselves off the report, so I don't even have to go tinker with the table anymore. Recipients can be um, pulled from other tables. When we had a case where we need to do that, we had users that every user from a certain place is supposed to get a report. So we did that. And um, we're using it more, we use it more than just in scripts and PSQL reports. We have some Java programs just directly calling this stuff and using it also. So it ended, even though it was simple, it ended up being able to supply a lot of um, things. And we just assigned report ID 79. So there aren't 79 because we're retired some, but we're probably about 75 reports are using that reporting, simple reporting system. Then of course we've got ideas for future phases, but the important part is there's still no plans to create that complex one. So trying to end on time, thank you for coming. And important thing is if you get that link at the bottom, you can download a PDF version of this presentation run through these examples and I guess I can answer quick we got a break coming up anyway but I can answer I'll, I'll answer any questions you got oh, thank you oh okay yeah yeah does anyone have
Oh, no questions? That's, that makes it easy on me. <laughs> but do feel free to ask me out there. <laughs>